back to Play Connect. I'm your host, Craig Sullivan. I've got one of my favorite people on the planet joining us today. And she has got so much information, you're not going to believe it. But you should. We are welcoming back Emmy Highs of CoStar Group. And before we bring her out to start the conversation, I would like to thank our friends at Red Roof Franchising and Chicago Title National Commercial Services Group for their help. And thank you, our audience, for your help in joining us on this journey. We really appreciate it. Now, with that done, here's Emmy Heise, co-star. How are you? Hi, Craig. Thanks for having me. Great to see you as usual. Oh, it's such a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for rejoining the conversation, my friend. I really appreciate it, Emmy. Of course. Hey, would you do me a favor, please? And for the one or two people that may not know you out there, would you tell them about yourself and CoStar Group, please? Sure. Uh, So as Craig said, I'm Emmy Heiss. I'm the Senior Director of Hospitality Analytics for the CoStar Group. I cover the Western United States. I spend a lot of time analyzing the state of California because a lot's going on there. And then CoStar is the leading provider of commercial real estate information, analytics, and online marketplaces. CoStar acquired STR Hospitality Data Company in 2019. Nice. Okay. I got one question before we really get into everything else. Is Bleasure now going to be a category with STR? Uh, I don't think they're going to officially define it as that. Some people really don't like the term and they prefer to call it <laughs> blended travel or, you know, some people like to have fun with it and call it the, the mullet travel, you know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Emmy, there's been a lot of stuff going on. You know, we just had two hotels in San Francisco, CMBS loans that the owner's handing the keys in. You know, what 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 does all of your stats say about San Francisco right now? Because I think it's still a great market. I think they've got, you know, some issues there, but we got a lot of issues across California and the country right now, too. Yeah. So in terms of hotel performance, uh, San Francisco is one of the least recovered markets if we're benchmarking to 2019. And quite frankly, most markets at this point in terms of ADR and RevPAR have exceeded 2019. So we're starting to use year over year comparisons. But since San Francisco is so far behind, we still benchmark it to 2019. That said, if you're looking at the absolute values of like average daily rate, San Francisco is towards the top of the list. It's just it hasn't surpassed 2019 levels, which makes it really hard. And then it's forecast for a slower recovery. It's going to take, you know, a few more years. And that makes it really tough for hotel owners that aren't getting revenues that they're used to. It used to be one of the highest top revenue generating markets, coupled with high interest rates and renovations that are coming due, it makes it really tough. It does. And I, you know, I, I was pleasantly surprised when I was up there somewhere between 30 and 45 days ago. Um, I stayed at the palace hotel, had a great stay, had a renovated room. They were doing some renovations while I was there. I walked out of the hotel the next morning and I expected to see trash and homeless people and graffiti and it, City looked great. I walked around during the day and I had no problems, didn't see any signs of distress. And, uh, you know, I just think that market, if you look at some of those assets, I mean, you can get them now at less than replacement cost. But, you know, we're having, you know, the, you know, part of our problem is we've got billions upon billions of dollars of CMBS loans coming due. And I'd like to hear your opinion on that. And, You know, the interest rate spikes. I mean, the the Fed seems to be taking a pause right now uh, on any hikes. So what what are you seeing and hearing from the lenders? What are some of the thoughts and reports that you're, you know, taken back by or think that there's signs of improvement in the marketplace? Well, um, I guess I can speak more to our data on what we have for CMBS loans. So before this call, I looked up um, 
for the entire state of California, there's 499 active CMBS loans. Um, 205 of them are on the watch list. And a lot of that, I think, is due to maturities about to happen. So within the next 12 months, over 200 of these CMBS loans are, or, sorry, 12 months, yeah, are coming due. Over 200 are coming due, which means that they're, that owners are going to have to get creative to hold on to hotels, whether it's refinancing, someone assuming the debt, bringing in partners. And just this year, I've seen a little bit of it all. Um, so, for example, Hotel Coronado in, in San Diego, uh, their debt is coming due this year, and they just got a $950 million refinance uh, close. And then the Waldorf Astoria uh, just got a 40% partner uh, in a partial interest uh, transaction. Uh, this month. So there's a lot of different things happening um, in terms of what hotels and owners are doing to try to make it work to hold on to these hotels as hotel uh, loans are maturing in a very different environment than we've seen. I, you know, I, and you're right. I, you know, I've seen those deals as well. And I, you know, I just kind of think, and, you know, with what's going on with that over 200 hotel loan maturities coming up just in California. Um, you know, is, is that going to be like 1991, 92 again? Uh, some of these people there, let's face it, you know, unless they can get, you know, uh, a cash call from their partners or they can find uh, a bridge lender. And I think bridge, you know, and mez debt is going to be something that is, is gonna, going to be used rather religiously. Um, I'm not sure if some of these people are going to be able to survive. And, you know, we've got a, a stack of political issues coming up in California. City of Los Angeles, 2024 has got a ballot measure that needs yeah. to be voted down. I very, I think Anaheim's got one in 2024. I'm not sure about San Francisco. But I typically that's a top five destination market, you know, for national and international travel. And I, you know, we, we all know it's going to come back. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of uh, positive signs in, you know, in the future. I think that, you know, Visit California and then, you know, yeah. Visit SF are putting a lot of marketing funds towards tourism, which they hadn't had to do as much in the past. And now they're starting to fund that knowing all right, some perceptions have changed and we need to start funding some of that. And I think that, you know, a lot of these cities, I you know it's not for a few years, but they're getting um, events that are going to garner, you know, worldwide attention from host cities from the World Cup in 2026, San Francisco and I believe LA. Yep. And then San Francisco just got the Super Bowl for 2026. Uh, there's a big international conference in San Francisco at the end of this year that will that brings a lot of the political top leaders. So I think that there's positive things on the horizon. It just sometimes takes a little bit to change those perceptions, especially, you know, when we're hearing a lot of things in these national news. And to your point, the different things on the ballot, the different legislation, which, you know, might scare away some owners uh, because that that impacts profitability, right? Yeah, it does, you know, and I, I was having a conversation with a friend yesterday and they're based out of Chicago and it's like, okay, you know what guys, we're not the only ones having problems. Okay. The, the national and local media are blowing things out of proportion in your fair city as well. And those perspectives are very hard to change. You know, when you're, you're getting beaten with it day in, day out on, you know, whether it's print media, social media, or traditional news outlets. And, you know, I think uh, Hotel Council, Council uh, San Francisco is doing a great job at promoting the city. Visit California, I've always loved what they do. And, you know, that's one of the few agencies within the state of California that makes money year in, year out. For every dollar they spend, I think they bring back like a dollar ten, a dollar twenty, something like that. Um, and we need to get that good word out there. Um, with the trophy assets that you man, you you just mentioned, you know, we've we've deal volumes slowed down, yeah. 
Um, M and A slowed down, but there's still a market out there for these trophy assets. I mean, are you seeing the gap between sales price and you know what the seller wants, what the buyer's willing to pay? Is that closing at all, or is that still part of the issue? Well, I think it's still part of the issue, and that's you know one of the reasons we're also seeing such a slowdown in transaction volume. So. Of course, you know, I love my data, Craig, so I've pulled some information, Good. but um, if I'm looking at year to date data compared to last year, 177 less hotels traded and the sales volume is down by nearly 70 percent. So that's a huge switch year over year. Um, and it's because of, you know, the interest rates, like you said, the buyer seller disconnect. That said, there are still deals happening in the right environment um, or in the right opportunity. So, um, for example, the standard closing in L.A. was a pretty significant deal that happened. Um, and then, you know, you're seeing other people take advantage of different opportunities to uh, bail owners out for a pretty good deal. But it's still decent pricing. I agree. I think it is decent pricing. And, you know, I, um, I I got tired of checking to see what was going on with, say, the, you mentioned the standard. I mean, the, the Chateau Maramont's one of my favorites just because of the history, you know, and, and it's like, what's going on here, guys? Come on. You know, are you still going to try and do the private club thing? I mean, you know, they, open up the hotel. Yeah. 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 So, definitely. You know, it's, it, it, it's interesting. And I think, you know, I, I don't want to insult the rest of the commercial real estate market, but it sure seems to me that we're in an envious position right now because there's a lot of money on the sidelines. There's a lot of people that have decided that multifamily and light industrial are not the commercial real estate world darlings. And our fundamentals are basically still really, really sound. Um, yeah. and I think we've, we've, we're going to have a lot of new, new owners come in, which, you know, for, for the industry, it's good and bad. Okay. Because you've now got, you know, fresh blood in here, fresh capital, but do, did they get the right advisors? Did they get the right information? Did they go to CoStar to get that information to, to, to really learn the market and and become a viable part of it. I mean, what do you what are you seeing out there with with first time owners? Um, I don't have data on first time owners, but one thing that struck me that you just said was that comparing it to the different commercial real estate asset types in terms of hotel transactions and. Uh, my colleague who covers the Northeast, Romy Poshwani, actually just posted an article this week saying that hotel asset volume, like transactions, is far exceeding office, which we know office is yeah. not great right now, but that hasn't happened before. And so it's brand hotel news now. If you want to check it out, it's a great article. Um, so I think that, and then also, you know, NYU was this week, and right. I've heard some pieces. I, I wasn't there, unfortunately that um, people were saying that getting deals done for that trade for $15 million or less is pretty easy, right? It's going to be all cash or regional banking or smaller loans. Right. Um, it's really financing is the issue and getting the right terms to make a deal pencil for those deals that are the higher prices. And I think that's the big crux of it. It's the financing issue for these big deals. I agree with you. And, you know, part of the problem is that we've had commercial loans basically on par with residential loans. And that is not sustainable. It's not real world. Um, you know, that was part of getting us out of the financial meltdown. Uh, but, you know, I, I, you, you, you know, when you can get a commercial loan at 4% or 6%, okay, that's a good deal. It's a great, great. Deal, you know, yeah. now if it's at nine, eh, it's still a good deal, but you know, you've got to look at your operations and everything else and, and maximize the opportunities to, to be able to monetize every square inch of the hotel that you possibly can without insulting your guests. And great. I'm not sure we've learned how to do that yet. I mean, F and B, you know, F and B for the first time at click six this year when you were there, 
was, you know, that and labor was brought up. Those are two of our bigger issues. We don't, as hoteliers, do F and B really well. You know, we've got to bring in people to teach us and, and learn this because it is a viable way. Now, I'm going to exclude the, the you know the destination resorts, the all inclusive resorts, and uh, most of the boutique side because they do get it. They understand that hey, craft cocktails, mm -hmm. uh, smaller menu, but really great food adds to that experience, and we need to do that and get away from these free buffets but you know that's just me rambling what do you what do you think it's going to take to, to to change some of these assets so that they can you know start maximizing uh you know their return on their investment you know i've heard different operators talking about making their spaces flexible so you know you can still have the groups that come in and leverage the conference services but let's say you don't have a group come in. Can you turn the meeting room into a pop-up coffee shop or like a pop-up food truck or a pop-up play area for kids with an activity center? And it's just leveraging those spaces so it can be utilized different days of the week, different times um, and figuring that out. So I think that's going to be a critical point. And I mean, understanding the customer base and who to target and and who to bring in, which I know it's so much easier for me to say out loud as someone who's not operating a hotel. Uh, but the knowledge of the research and marketing of that, I think, is the power that hotels have to try to leverage uh, what they have. I also think we're starting to hit a different season. Um, yep. I think leisure visitors are still a big part of the travel industry, and I think they're going to continue to be. Um, but I think that it is starting to normalize a little bit. Um, and we're seeing that in some of our leisure destinations. So it's still way above 2019, but looking year over year, it's slowing down, but it's now being offset by that group again. And so that's right. why it's important to segment and know and be able to be versatile and like what the needs are and understand seasonality again. I agree with you. And, you know, knowing your seasons and knowing, you know, okay, Last of the schools, at least in Orange County, California, are closing this week for summer vacation. So, you know, you've still got Herb and Martha and their 2.5 kids that, you know, they're still on a revenge tour for being locked up all of 2020. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think we all are to some degree. And But, you know, again, we know that that pipeline is going to dry up at some point. So you've got to get you know, everything else that you possibly can. And I don't think this Russian roulette that some, you know, of our hotel brethren play by just simply slashing rate is the answer. No. Um, you know, what's Never going on in the area? What's coming in? <laughs> what is, what's the next, you know, 30, 45, 90, 120 days look like? And, you know, that information is just critical. And I think to your point too, not only did the pandemic shift priority to travel, but also it's the different generations that value experiences over, you know, having the perfect home and the great car. They're like, no, I want to go on this vacation. I'm going to save up, quit my job, go on a month long vacation, come back, work in, save up again. And, you know, so I think that that's changing. And then on top of that, you have a like a, the retiring community that is like, I want to travel. I mean, that's yeah. my goal for my life. I want to retire and travel for the rest of my yeah. life. So that's what I'm trying to make happen. And I think a lot of other people are in the same boat. Yeah. But are you going to stay at hotels or are you getting a motor home? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm in the hotel industry, so I feel like I am going to say hotels. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, but, you know, I have the added perk of, you know, a husband as a pilot, so I'm hoping to cash in on some free flights and that'll help. Nice. Spot, so. Good for you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, what are you seeing on the horizon with new development? I think, you know, we've got pips going left and right. Talking to designers, they seem to be really active on pips. There's a lot of, let me say, pre pre construction yes. work going on. The entitlement process, the design process, haven't signed the franchise agreement yet. What are you seeing out there on on new development? So, in terms of under construction rooms, I would say it's flatlining to slightly negative on a national level. 
but the final planning and planning rooms to your point are really high. And I think it's every, everybody is getting excited, wants development to happen, wants to have everything ready. So once the environment is a little bit better, it's full steam ahead, green light. So to your point, I'm hearing a lot of planning and then just waiting till they can actually hit the, the start button. I agree. I think right now, you know, the prudent owner operator, um, you know, if you're buying property, you're going through the entitlement process. You know, you're, you're looking at, you know, adaptive reuse. You're, you're looking at old big box hotels and urban centers. You're looking, you know, California coastal, anywhere coastal, Gulf coast, East coast, uh, the panhandle and, and, uh, in, uh, te- in, uh um, Florida, you know, and, and I think that, you know, everybody is got sticker shock when it comes to construction costs and material costs and whether those trends are going to start reversing themselves or not, I'm not too sure about. And I'm also very concerned going into an election year next year that that's going to have a major impact not only on hospitality, but the entire nation, because it's like all bets are off every time there's a presidential election. There's always something, you know, that that, that happens that throws everybody into a tailspin. What are you thinking about that? I think that at least for the next six to nine months, people are going to remain cautious, whether it's uh, development purchasing hotels, making sure that a deal pencils, because we're in a weird time right now between, you know, an expected upcoming recession, hearing about layoffs, an election year, there's a lot of variables right now going on. And so people are only going to move forward spending hot, like large sums of money if they're really confident. So I think we're kind of in a wait and see hold period for at least six to nine months. Um, I'm not sure on the election piece yet, but I think I'm cautiously optimistic that it's going to only be a six to nine month slowdown of waiting. Waiting, yeah. I I really hope you're right on that. I really do. Yeah. If there's one thing that I could wish for and get, that's it right there. <laughs> I know um, it's so hard to say. We've been talking about this recession for how long? We thought it was years. Q1, Q2. Now we're saying, you know, Q3, Q4, it it keeps getting pushed a little bit, but we keep hearing a little bit more and a little bit more that's making people, I think, uneasy. It's kind of like those CMBS loans that got pushed down the road, you know? (laughs) (laughs) M&A, you hearing anything on mergers and acquisitions right now that uh, gets your radar going and and looking for, for more of that, less of that right now? What do you think? You know, I don't, I haven't really heard of anything. I've heard obviously rumors, but until it actually happens, I'm not one to speak on it because it's a, yeah. So I you never know. Yeah. It's always a rumor. It's, you know, yeah. you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, you know, when people are in a deal, they'll deny it left, right and center. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, you know, and once they go radio silent, you go, oh, okay, now they're in it. You know, now, yeah, we know it now. Okay. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. So let's just say I wouldn't be surprised if some happened, but I'm yeah. not, you know, as a data person, I'm not one to comment until it's solid. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. What are you seeing out there data wise for, you know, our extended stay side of the of the tree is, uh, you know, really produced a lot of great results for the industry as a whole. Um, and it seems like everybody's announcing, you know, another extended stay brand right now. What do you, what are your thoughts on extended stay? What is your data telling you on that? Um, I think extended stay is definitely a, a safer, um, probably, thought to investors just because of the length of stay. And it's a completely yeah. different business model. Uh, it's almost, it's kind of like multifamily, but not, you don't need as many staff. You don't need as many amenities. And then again, you have such a long length of stay. You have that steady stream of business and it was the least impacted uh, asset type during the pandemic. So I think that makes people feel safe. 
Um, one thing that's interesting that I just came across um, that someone brought up to me is um, because of the project homeless or home key, yeah. um, they're looking for extended stay products. And so in San Diego, the housing commission there is considering purchasing some extended stay properties for above 300 K a key, um, which doesn't, wow. you know, as a hotel might not make sense, but it's less than building a new property. Right. And so it's just this interesting time with extended stay as far as people wanting to acquire them, whether to keep them as a hotel or turning them into affordable housing. There's a lot more opportunity for conversion, I think, because the kitchens and kitchenettes are already there. And maybe that's yeah. another reason why it's a kind of a safe bet where you can potentially flip it to an alternative use if needed. Yeah, I mean, take, let's say a gen one residency in, okay, that, is really beyond its its life cycle and may not be in the best location, uh, you know. And if it wasn't, you know, if it isn't running as an independent now, it will be the next time there's a there's a pip, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it certainly makes sense in the uh, the ballot measure that the city of Los Angeles wants to every hotelier to check in by two p.m. and and let them know what empty rooms they have so they can issue vouchers. I mean, come on. You know, it's like you're draining the coffers, you're destroying the equity in my hotel, you're putting my staff at risk, you're putting, you know, my guest at risk, and now my I'm going to fight you over my real estate taxes because they're way too high because you've adversely impacted the, the value of my asset. So it's like, stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, hopefully that ballot measure doesn't pass. <laughs> um yeah, I mean, I, I, what well, city council shut it down and passed it to the ballot, so yeah. that's one positive sign. Um, and I think that the you know HLA and the and CHLA are doing a good job of trying to educate uh, voters to let yeah. them know, um, you know. And it, we yeah. we all have to band together on that. It's it, not just the you know H and LA and CH and LA, but it it's it, it's it's clear. It's it's every trade organization it is every flag it's every management company it's every owner we we all need to go out there because if we get complacent on this and think mm -hmm. that oh you know what we can count on is not in my neighborhood that's mm -hmm. when it's going to happen and it's going to go through and yeah. it'll be too late then yeah. And I think I heard there's legal pushback on that tax incentive increase in LA. So we'll have to just stay tuned and see what happens yeah. with that. Yeah, absolutely. What you've got, you know, a great information source in front of you every day. <laughs> what gets you excited to see? What report, what it, little bit of information is coming through CoStar? You, it gives you that aha uh -huh moment. Um, I mean, I like seeing, oh, actually, I'm most excited right now that we're really going back to the year over year trends and seeing what's happening, like diving into the day of week data, the segmentation to see, you know, what from COVID might stay, what is going back to normal, because we're finally in this time period where we're not getting impacted uh, by different variants. And so I am get the most excited digging in to see what is the new normal and what is coming back to what we're used to seeing. So I think in that sense, just really diving into the data and playing that way. And it really varies market to market. And so that's fun for me to see too. Absolutely. All right, my friend, are you ready? Time for our infamous lightning round. All right, let's do it. Okay. Two minutes on the clock. Word okay. association, just the first thing that pops into your head. Okay. Capital. Did you say capital? capital? Yes. Well, I thought of Denver. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which is, I know you're talking about investment capital, but you said the first word that came into my mind, and that's what it was. That's good. Hotels. Uh, I honestly, the first word that came into mind was love. <laughs> like, I love going to hotels and traveling and seeing different designs. You and me both. Labor. Labor. Ooh, tough is the first word that comes to mind. 
your favorite band, group, duo, or solo artist? Uh, <laughs> so I should say Emmy Lou Harris because that's who I'm named after, but I'm actually nice. going to go with uh, Dolly Parton, which they did do a trio. They together. did. That's right. And so maybe I should go with that. <laughs> nice. I love it. Favorite movie? Favorite movie. Oh, that is such a tough one. Um, I think it might be The Greatest Showman. It just makes me so happy. Wow. <laughs> nice answer. I like that. Um, conferences. What's my favorite conference? Click. What? There you cool. go. I love that. Of course. Thank I you. mean, that's, that's <laughs> an easy answer, right? <laughs> uh, number one bucket list item. Uh, to go to Greece. Um, I really want to go there. I've traveled to Europe. That's on my bucket list right now. Best restaurant. Ooh, best restaurant. Um, I think my favorite restaurant I've been to lately is called Garden Grace in uh, Denver. It's delicious. <laughs> so if you're in Denver. Red, you know. red or white wine? Uh, depends on the season. We're in summer, so I'm going to say white. Nice. You did that with six seconds left. Very good. <laughs> Emmy, thank you so much for joining us. One last question before you get your shameless plug. Okay. What one thing do you want the hotel community to know about CoStar? I think that it is a single source of data instead of researching a bunch of different uh, sources from public information to transactions to office to retail, everything that can impact a hotel decision. Uh, it's a single source to find it all. And it's up to date. We have such a big team of researchers that are constantly working hard to make sure we have great data. Yes, you do. And thank you very much. How can people get a hold of you, Emmy? The best way is via email. Uh, which is eheis at costar.com. And since my name's at the bottom there, you know how to spell it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. Thank you again for joining the conversation. You've got an open invitation to come back anytime you want. Thank you so much, Emmy. It's been just a privilege and an honor to have you on the show today. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. I always love you asking me to join. <laughs> Take care. I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Thank you, our audience, for joining us today. But I also have to thank a couple of other companies. You know who they are. Red Roof Franchising and Chicago Title National Commercial Services Group, California. Thank you very much for being part of the show today. Emmy is just a wonderful, wonderful person and a great resource for you. Please reach out to her. Reach out to our friends at Red Roof and also at Chicago Title. Um, you know... You can find us all over social media. We've got our YouTube channel. Please subscribe and smash that bell there so that you're notified of all the new episodes, the vlogging. We've got conferences coming up. I'll be doing live shows from there. Um, you can also find us on, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So, and as I'm fond of saying, be kind, share your knowledge. Now go be amazing. Be amazing.